Hello, all of you. They are great souls. We had wonderful session. Uh, we finished the first session. Now we are all together with all of you. And we are waiting our guests to come uh, to join us. And also, dear Lorraine, we are with you. And all of our guests are welcome. Warm welcome. Hey. Hello. Hello, all of you. <laughs> Warm Hello, welcome. Everyone. <laughs> Hello. Dear Lorraine, we are with you and you are moderator of our uh, sessions today. I am sending my best wishes all of our guests and wait, uh, we, we, we can start. I think our guests will join us. Okay. I just wanted to uh, underline your wonderful work, Ms. Lian, your beautiful heart and you you are an amazing leader and speaker thank you so much thank you so we are going to start this afternoon with our uh, youngest speaker but not uh the, the least powerful um <laughs> miss jada uh, alabak basak um she empowers uh young uh, people to and lift them up but I, I wanted to let her uh, speak about her mission uh, with her own words that are so touching first of all thank you so much for having me here today it really means a lot I think it's not only uh, it makes me really happy to have the opportunity to talk, but also it means a lot because as the people of my generation, we really enjoy having the opportunity to talk about ourselves, express ourselves, but um, it's obviously not as common as we would always like it to be like. Um, so I really appreciate being here today. Thank you so much. Um, so like if I have to talk about myself so to start off, I would say I'm not only representing my initiative today, which I will talk about, but I also um, represent the um, youth group that um, is also really happy to have me here as their representatives today. And what we basically do is we um, are a group of teenagers, I would mostly say from mostly Turkey, but um, other parts of the world as well. For example, as in the moment I'm in the United States, but basically we work towards um, like educating other teenagers and building different skills and just trying to become <clears throat> world citizens that are able to have a good grasp in multiple areas, which I think is really important. And um, if I have to like speak about my initiative, basically, um, I would say from a young age, I was always really like passionate about science, math, <clears throat> and was mostly interested in these like areas while I was at school. And as I grew older and was exposed to more um, like opportunities regarding coding, programming, perhaps, I realized I was really interested in this and started considering it as a potential career for myself. But over time, I kind of realized how um, like not like women, especially women of color, are not necessarily always supported in these fields. And a lot of younger girls um, do lack the opportunity or the necessary exposure to these um, like STEM opportunities I've been talking about. So what I first did was I started to um, like look for ways I could contribute towards um, bringing more diversity into STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And I first took action by contacting teenage girls living in different areas who I thought would be interested in my mission. And I researched and mapped out the necessary steps we each needed to take to reach out to the younger girls in our communities. We started having weekly meetings to discuss our work and brainstorm activities related to 
um, STEM and gender equality. And later on, we proceeded to mentor um, younger girls starting from kindergarten and going until 12th grade. And we organized weekly meetings, activities, and workshops during which we would um, help these girls. And over time, the more, more positive feedback I got from this like small community I created, the more like encouraged I, and motivated I became, I feel like. And um, like as in the moment, like I mentioned, we are mentoring or like helping out younger girls. And even though COVID has obviously like shifted a lot um, for us as well, we do continue our mission or like our work through um, virtual environments, including Zoom and our website and Instagram and all that other fun stuff. And I feel like the work we do is like really important because we're all mostly like teenagers working towards this and we try to help other girls coming from different backgrounds um, to um, have perhaps like better um, opportunities than some of us may have had growing up and also we try to create the safe space in which everyone can share their truth and their reality because it's always really important to accept and acknowledge everyone's different experiences, even if it doesn't necessarily match with our own. For, for instance, if I have a guy friend who is also studying engineering in college, um, his experience is for sure going to be different from mine, but that does not mean that he can't understand me, he can't work towards solving my issues working with me. So I think it's really important to always be unifying and understanding and accepting of others. So we lead um, is not only um, towards like helping girls improve their coding skills or improve themselves in science fields, but it's also this social platform that allows people to express themselves more freely. And I think that's really important. So um, uh, I hope in the future, as time goes on, as I can um, continue like investing in myself as everyone else who is in this program right now. I hope to achieve even like greater things um, because I think it's like really important to work towards this mission. Thank you. Oh, I can't hear you. Are you saying something? Can you hear us, Jada? Oh yes, right now I can. Yes, uh, Jada. As a younger generation, what uh, are you advising to understand your generation? Because I have kids as well. They are totally thinking different than me. Sometimes we have conflicts and crashes. Uh, what do you advise to understand you better? Because in digital world, they, they wake up with digital and they are sleeping uh, with digital applications. It is so difficult to get in touch with them. Uh, what is your advice to us to understand your generation? Um, I think, first of all, even asking this question is a really important step towards understanding us, I feel like, because, um, like, obviously, communication is the most important step. Um, but what I would say is, since we live in the, like, era of technology, and we literally have access to everywhere in the world um, through our phone, and social media is just so widely used and it's so common right now. So a lot of like teenagers um, or like people from my generation, we really like get to have a grasp of um, a lot of different places in the world, regardless of where we live. So um, like everyone, I, I feel like what we want is to be like heard and understood. And the way that goes to that is through communication, like I mentioned. Um, what I would say is with like, um, perhaps your children or other um, younger people you're talking to, even if you don't necessarily ag agree with what they're like stating, obviously we know that we can do mistakes. We're not always gonna be right. We're not always going to um, state the truth because you obviously have more experience than us. But we, what we want is to be heard and acknowledged and perhaps discuss why we're wrong so that we can actually see our mistakes rather than just simply being told we're wrong, if that makes sense. And uh, another question, Lorraine, can you hear us? Yes, of course I can. Uh, yes. Lorraine, maybe, maybe you can add more 
about resume selector. So we want to serve younger generation. So, uh, you can ask to her about. Uh, I think it would be more about being inspired by by by your work, uh, Jada. What to to expand your your impact? What do you expect from social media at the moment? Um, that is a good question. I would say from social media, if I could perhaps um, increase the amount of followers I had maybe on LinkedIn or on Instagram even, or maybe if I could promote my website through different like platforms or our website to be more exact, but um, just like in general, reaching out to more people would definitely um, help me perhaps like have a greater impact. And for that, until this moment, I feel like until now, we have over 2000 followers on Instagram and our website seems to be doing well. But um, the more people I can reach out to, I definitely think the more impact I can have. And the way to that seems to be, um, like I mentioned, like LinkedIn or like different social media platforms would definitely be like a contributor. And I think just like being active and um, attending different um, events such as this one and being able to speak out and express ourselves is also a really important step towards um, like having more influence in this like um, field. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm really impressed with what you have achieved so far and the way you approach is amazing. My question is, what do you really want to see in terms of yourself achieved in the next five years, 10 years? I, this is like a typical interview question, but you're Mr. a genius Yoz, girl, and I'm really curious about that. Mr. Yos, could you open your camera? Yes, now you can. I'm actually, I'm actually doing a shopping. That's why I'm outside. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. Before they close down, I had to get out. I apologize. Okay. Okay. So uh, what do you think, you know, in the next five and 10 years, uh, you will be doing, and where, when you achieve that, uh, you will say, yes, I did it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I am obviously pretty young right now. I am currently a 12th grader. It's my last year in high school. So um, I would say my first step will be to go to college, hopefully right now. <clears throat> I'm working on my college application. So that is going um, well so far. But in the upcoming five years, I guess I would definitely want to um, complete my major in I want to study computer science in college, but I would like to double major. So like um, not only studying computer science, but also hopefully um, have another like major or like degree in a more social area, wh whether that is gender studies or maybe sociology that can help me um, combine like science with more social stuff so that I can like continue doing similar work to what as to what I'm doing right now. And after graduating or maybe during my college experience, I definitely want to continue the work I do at WeLead and hopefully reach out to larger audiences. And um, once I graduate, I would definitely like to, um, if I had to like, if I, if I decide to start working immediately, I would want to start to work with companies who do support diversity, um, whether that is gender diversity or racial diversity, because those are really important um, topics we need to like focus on. But um, I, during my college experience, I kind of want to get a better grasp of entrepreneurship as well, so that I can hopefully advance um, what I currently have, like the We Lead initiative, but also maybe come up with new stuff that can, um, allow me to um, be, I guess, like more successful or like allow me to work towards um, social issues while, um, wh while putting in my best effort, just like everyone else in this um, program has been doing. I think the work everyone has done so far, like it's just amazing to see. And it really like inspires me and like tells, tells gives me a better grasp of where I would like to be in five or 10 years because, um, I don't know. I'm just really like happy to see um, how like how my life can look like maybe in five to 10 years if I continue like working and being brave and all that.
Well, you are amazing. I mean, the the things you want to achieve is great. And combining is a really, really good way to go, especially in these times, you know, myself as a physician, I have done an executive MBA and combined and moved to media and investment. So it's always good to combine different things in different geographies. I know you'll be very successful. Uh, I have no question in my mind. Wish you the best. And uh, my last question is, who are you inspired by? Who are your role models? Or do you have any role model? Yeah, um, I definitely do. One of my role models. So if I had to look at more like historical figures, I would say one would be Mary Curie, only because of her awesome work in science fields, despite um, the like times she lived in. She was actually the first um, woman or person, perhaps, I'm not entirely sure, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in a few different science fields, which I think is um, absolutely mind-blowing, ex- especially considering how um, competitive um, the environment was with her male peers at her time. But um, as in right now, I obviously, I would say one person um, I'm inspired by is Carly Kloss, because um, perhaps like not every, she's not, I don't know if anyone in this room has heard of her, but basically she used to be a model, but then um, after like finding more about um, women and like STEM and science, she started to launch these coding um, like camps during summers to give free coding education to girls, which I think is a really important step to take. Um, So pretty much like anyone who is trying to bring diversity and equality um, into these fields are definitely among my among the people that I look up to. Jada, I wish you the best. You're an amazing girl. You will shine. I'm very sure about it. And let us know how we can help anytime in your future career. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Jada, on your LinkedIn account, you post, you are open to share. There's a specification open to work and you use open to share then uh, in resume selector we already have how how can i I help to someone else there's an option in our social media platform Mm -hmm. and i saw you have same dream like us because we we we did two years ago this uh, specification inside our application and how how did you get this conclusion um, I think for a moment you glitched for me. Do you mind repeating your question? Uh, if I don't remember wrong, uh, mm-hmm. there is a specification inside LinkedIn open to work. Right. And we have written open to help. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and also the, there is a spe- specification we, we, in all application, resumeselector.com for open to help. Who needs help? Uh, he or she can ask to me. And, uh, how, what do you think about it? Oh right. So yeah, I think. Um, so if I understand like your question correctly, basically you are ask. Are you like asking if, if like you're open to help? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think that is like an awesome thing to do because obviously like helping each other, like helping younger generations or like helping people who can benefit from us is a like really important step to take. Um, so yeah, I I would support it. And I think like it's really important to um, obviously like support other people. I personally, um, I, I'm very like grateful or like have, or, or I become really like happy and I really appreciate it when um, people I look up to, especially on LinkedIn or like other platforms, um, reach a hand, reach out a hand, because I obviously as a young person um, do sometimes like struggle putting my word outside and like, um, it's not always easy to make yourself heard by other people since you're so young so sometimes people don't even take you that seriously but I think like helping um like other people and like helping people like myself perhaps it's really important and I personally would like to help um those who would perhaps like need my help in the future so thank you so much 
You are such a source of inspiration. You are really amazing. And considering what you what you what you said, you are going to be very interested in uh, our uh, next guest uh, speech, Mrs. Mariette Ram, because two things she has read, she has wrote, sorry, she has written uh, the entrepreneur's ultimate greed LinkedIn. It's uh, it's for you to improve, you know, the number of followers and have and develop a real strategy. And she has also created a company called Strategin to help you. Uh, navigate LinkedIn. I, I'll let um, Mrs. Ram. Mrs. Ram? Yes, hi. Hi. I <laughs> Sorry. I, I, that was hi. Funny. <laughs> hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> It's really good to see you. What, what to to begin with? What would be your first advice to uh, to um, our our Jada? First of all, it's an absolute pleasure to participate in this high uh, caliber event. Absolutely delighted, and also I have to say that these are my personal experiences. So, if it fits really well with you use the skills, use the talents, use the skills, use the tips, everything that I'm putting out. If you think that it's absolute nonsense, then just, then just let it out. So, but I'm here to give my absolutely my 100% to what I've done, how I've done it, and, and what I think is really moving, propelling forward people right now in 2020, especially after an incredibly tough year that we've had. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you if you could hear uh, what uh, Jada was saying about LinkedIn a few minutes ago. Yes. Yes. Could you could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> yes. Um, I was I was asking her what she was expecting from social media platform at the moment, and she she was she was saying uh, talking about increasing the, the her numbers of followers so that she can have, she can spread her wisdom that she's gained through her um, different projects. What you, and you have written this fantastic uh, book on about LinkedIn, the greed, entrepreneurs ultimate, ultimate greed on LinkedIn. And also you have a, a strategy consulting uh, agency, Strategy In. What would be your recommendation for her? Oh, my recommendation, it's my approach really is a omni-channel, a multi-channel approach. And it's actually quite intriguing how I kind of landed in this position because my background is basically is, is digital PR and, and um, marketing. And I, I primarily work with ultra high net worth and high net worth and family offices. So when the crisis really hit Europe, um, um, turning of February, March, suddenly I just basically ended up seeing myself as, as basically from Monday to Tuesday, it's like life completely stuck, uh, stopped. And uh, I, I don't know what your experiences are, but it was seriously like from Monday to Tuesday, absolutely nothing. And I got a call um, right after that. I got a call from a friend of mine who is a um, corner of a PPA manufacturer in China. And he just asked, you know, how are you doing and what's happening? And um, I said, well, you know, right now it's nothing really going on. So I said, are you, you know, happy to do some business development for us? So I thought, yeah, absolutely. Why not? I'm currently right now I'm not doing anything. So I went into profile searches. Uh, went into more getting involved with with with, uh, with general profiles, but it was more with the, the, the intention of actually finding the right people that I thought would be beneficial for that particular project. And I noticed that um, a lot of profiles were actually incomplete, incomplete as maybe, you know, the summaries missing, or I, I just didn't have really an idea. And it's, it kind of I started talking to, to to members about it and what their ideas were and and and in terms of 
you know, because we are on LinkedIn, whatever the reason we are on LinkedIn, whether it's it's business development, collaboration, whether it's a, it's, it's a job search, it's um, any kind of um, uh, non-profit organization, you know, marketing strategies. Uh, it would be really ideal if someone lands on our profile page. It's like, wow, you know, I, I really want to see that, pro, that, that power profile. And um, I've been re uh, writing quite a lot of material uh, for various magazines and, and publications, and obviously with my, my, my PR activities. So I thought that I could help out, you know, just really feature basically people the best with their best possible abilities and best possible skills on, on LinkedIn and really uh, condense it into solid 350 words that really gives a uh, pure essence of who they really are, what their value proposition is, what they can give to their audience. And I noticed really there's, a, there's been a huge shift of that right now of members who are on LinkedIn, they are really looking for what is what is this value? What is this person? What does this person stand for? What is the value that this person is giving? And can I actually associate with this value? The, the, the, the person's value is actually resonating with my values. Where do I actually see that connection? Because although it's okay, it's companies and and and and and, and various um, uh, deeper levels that goes inside, but. Uh, fundamentally, people want to connect with people. Human want to connect with humans. Uh, sorry, humans in plural. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm very hands on. Um, if someone sends me a direct message, whatever it may be, it's, if it, it's a hello direct message or it, it's a pitch direct message, I will answer it. And I personally, I really think that that kind of uh, um, differentiates. Uh, on LinkedIn, a really good CEO, C-level person from another C-level person that you know that there is that in, emotional intelligence component on top of it that you know that the company is standing out, what he represents, what his company is representing, what his employees are representing, because at the end of the day, it's all a teamwork. It's, it's all something that I can associate with and I can certainly believe in this course. And I think those are the points that can really make strong and, and, and profound collaborations. So <laughs> with respect of you know, where the value is coming from is definitely is authenticity, really giving out of what the company is, what the person is all about and finding and reflecting it back from the audience. You know, whatever you're seeking is seeking you at the end of the day. So, and there are almost 700 million people on LinkedIn, so I'm definitely sure there are going to be lots and lots of followers and connections to, to be coming along in the, in the following month. You are muted. Yes, so sorry. And um, now now that your, your journey was about uh, relation uh, with extremely, yeah. extremely high level. Have you seen um, an evolution during this last few months, during this, this, this, this period of crisis? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? It's a little bit breaking up here. Yes, your, your journey was uh, in public relation at extremely high level. Have you seen, beside um, the, the, the, the period of um, of lockdown, do you think this crisis will modify completely our way to uh, to to communicate about ourselves, about our products, about our companies? I definitely like to see more communication moving more to the digital, and although I think larger companies, public companies been really successfully utilizing digital media to, to absolutely the, to, the fine art. Now I think it's moving down more, more towards SMEs as well, that yes, we certainly have to have a, a solid strategic plan here or what we're going to do in terms of, in terms of basically uh, um, 
uh, maintaining our PR marketing and advertising strategies. Um, and I, I also would like to see, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting that there are a lot of CEOs and C-level who are using LinkedIn on a, what I call a, a, a, a spying basis. <laughs> so they are present. They are definitely on LinkedIn and they are approachable, which I think it's absolutely superb. So we're going back to the same point, uh, but I've just raised, raised prior that authenticity. They are looking for that one on one connection. And I think they are very much open to the possibility of, of OK, from next year, uh, what we're going to do. And also when it was quite remarkable to see results when it came to offices uh, shut down, uh, you know, suddenly the digital resources had to be really immobilized, but on an absolutely massive, massive, massive scale. And this, this, how do you maintain the integrity and the trustability of a company uh, with the employees, because at the end of the day, your employees are your best advocates. They are your, your best ambassadors. So it's the kind of communication channel that I see it as from a company basis to uh, the ambassadors down to the public. But the ambassadors really who are enabled and so, uh, uh, uh, habilitated this, this um, uh, kind of uh, digital uh, flow through LinkedIn and, and through other networks as well. So I think it's suddenly, suddenly there's a realization that, you know, employees and uh, stakeholders, uh, you know, they can be a huge, massive part in the digital feedback, what we are getting and how is the best possible way is to actually to, to, to mine this in a way of that, yes, we are, uh, we are looking after people, we are making changes, uh, we are pivoting. These are the various strategies that, strategies that we are aligning with in order to, um, in order to, uh, uh, to, uh, to continue our, our, our uh, uh, development, our, our functioning. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, I mean, digit, the digital uh, resources, and I will see this definitely uh, as, a, as an ongoing trend, that digital communications and digital apps and uh, facilitations, uh, there's going to be more part of everyday life. And... Uh, Nevertheless, it kind of underlines things of, you know, from a human perspective, when you see that the human to human contact is just so much more, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, rewarding. And there are various biochemical processes in the body when obviously when there's a face to face meeting, when it's a handshake going on in the boardroom. Um, and so how will that be, how will that be able to manage? There's been a lot of association uh, going on between uh, mental disorder and depression and, and, and isolation, various issues with increased use of, of digital, public, uh, digital communication channels. So that will be an interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, trend to watch really in the, in, in the coming years. And, and it's definitely mental health and, and, and sea level, although uh, not many are actually venturing into the topic. Um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. It's, and it's worth a, a huge discussion in itself. Absolutely. And uh, we would love to continue on that subject, but would you mind, and for days, I mean, but would you mind if we go a little bit more personal so, to, so that you can share part of your journey to, to success with our audience? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Just, yes. just a, a, a straightforward question and I'm happy to answer, to, happy to answer any questions. <laughs> so basically, you achieved, you are where you are now. And what were the elements and key points that you tackled that brought you to the old level now so we can learn from you wow that is just such a complex question that is seriously complex question 
um, I think personal development, professional development, uh, sum it up over a course of 20 years, although I, I, I hope I'm still <laughs> still having my <laughs> my useful looks. Uh, it's certainly something that can't, can't be summed up uh, in, in, in, in five, 10 minutes. Uh, if I really have to pinpoint the turning point, um, there are certain aspects where there are certain behaviors and there are certain beliefs that a person goes through from very much from a career point to up to where I can say that, okay, I'm successful. I believe in what I'm doing and I believe what I'm doing is right. Um, I remember back when I was in late teens, 20s, in my 30s, and, you know, early 40s, and I'm just seeing this really profound self-development journey, and I can only speak from a female perspective here. Maybe a male, maybe a, a gentleman would experience this com from a completely different perspective. But me be <laughs> being a, a, a female, that's, that, that's all I have experience with, is that I really embraced my, my emotions. I really made, really embraced my, um, the emotional intelligence, so to speak. And it kind of sounds, may sound a little bit elevated in a way but when you look at it uh on a on a daily basis or the, on a practical basis what that entails is really about learning about one's emotions um i think it has been touched on a basis that you know we are very much we are incredibly emotional human beings and the emotions is are associated by thoughts so once you once one understands and tries to control the thought mechanism that will have direct uh, impact on the emotions and the emotions will have direct impact on the result that we are getting. Now, if I'm thinking back, I, you know, very much had to, to, um, to uh, think about certain aspects, for example, you know, accountability. And this is, for example, when I'm talking about accountability, is accountability to myself, okay? Not putting the blame on someone else. This is, these are the, the, the points of emotional intelligence, and it has been proven that emotional intelligence goes a lot, lot beyond them and uh, significantly contributes to success of successful organizations as opposed to simple IQ. EQ is massively, massively, massively important. And maybe ladies have got certain... Uh, uh, certain uh, advantages here because we are a little bit tend to be more in line with our emotions and and and tend to re recognize really of, of of how we feel at certain situation how we feel about ourselves and can also relate to how others feel towards us in a certain situation so this can really help with communication skills um, um yes confidence there is another there is another there is another issue uh, that i can uh, that i can see uh, evolving over the years, um, you know, honest, honesty, uh, trust, uh, you know, how learning to inspire and motivate people through really learning from, you know, I believe that whatever, you know, I've personally gone through and I've got a bestseller book about this as well. This is, this is, this is another bestseller book that I co-authored um, that I believe that our personal experience, everything that I've gone through in my life, I would go through it again, you know, without any question, because it made me the person who I am today. And it made me this confident person. If you talk to me, probably five years, 10 years, 20, 30 years ago, I would not be the same person. So I had to go through that experience. And I really encourage everybody that, you know, whatever that experience, it had to come into your life because, because it was meant for you you know, whatever negative negative is happening, whether it's a loss of a partner, you know, uh, either to, you know, to any life-threatening illnesses or suicide, loss of a child, a loss of a parent, various businesses that are, uh, that, you know, you just basically, you just can't, can't contain, so you have to shut the door because that's it. And you have to say, yeah, well, I, 
did not make it. So, and then you start again. So these are all various stages of the life journey and embrace it in full, absolutely in full. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is beautiful, Mariette. I, uh, I just want to highlight one point. Uh, you know, so what is your definition of success? You said something so essential. You embrace yourself, your failures, your achievements, all you have done because you appreciate you are who you are with all the experiences you had. Would you say your definition of success was different 10 years ago and will be different in the next 10 years? It's oh, oh, oh. 10 years ago, even five years ago. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lauren. Just one, one second. It's an amazing question, but we, if, if it's possible that it's, it can be short because we have five other speakers that are waiting, and, uh, but we could continue. And I invite every, every member of our audience to follow you on, on LinkedIn because your content is, is, is mind-blowing and insightful. And first of all, I have to talk. I have to talk. Uh, because uh, I have to confess gratitude to Marian. Dearest Marian, thank you for everything you do. And I appreciate all your leadership. And you have high level of emotional intelligence. You are one of those great goodwill workers of LinkedIn. That's why I have to confess my gratitude to you. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Thank you. So can you can you just answer? Sorry, um, may you, I, I let you finish absolutely your your your question to finish your interview. Sixty seconds. Sixty seconds. Yes. It Thank was you. definitely ten years ago, even five years ago, the definition would have been completely different, and I'm definitely sure ten years is going to be again different. So we're going to have to re redo this seminar again, <laughs> this okay. meeting in ten years to see to see the definition of success. Thank you for the amazing question. Thank you. Thank you, Mariette. You're amazing. You are an inspiration. Thank you, Lorraine. You're God back to you. you. Thanks. Thank you, Yavuz. Thank you so much. Now we have we are we are blessed to uh, to welcome Mrs. Kor Korsak. I don't know if I pronounce it I pronounce it correctly. She has a journey that is mind blowing she was an analyst at jp morgan and she became the ceo of the Gal galata sahai who is one of the most famous uh, soccer team in the world so i would like to to uh, to to thank you for being here and on the top of that one of her passion is to uplift other women. How could you um, harmonize those two dimensions in your life? Maybe she's not here. Um, Miss, Mrs. Kos Kosa? Koksa? Great. No, I actually, my lung dropped for a second. I'm back now. I didn't realize you were asking me hello. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was telling about your, your career. Yes. Okay. As, um, as it is me, unusual. Very unusual. Yeah, and, yes. <laughs> and as, as uh, Mrs. Ram, you have reached like the, the extremely high level in your field. And it was uh, JP Morgan and then CEO at the Garrett of the High. Yes. And, and on the top of that, you have a second dimension in your career. It's uplift your passion to uplift yes. other women. Yes, exactly. How could you harmonize those two, two dimensions in your life? Yeah, well, um, I guess many thanks to the previous speakers, but um, like Mariette was saying, we are a different generation where we were guided by many different ambitions and, and principles, whereas uh, look at Jada, you know, she's already figured it out in grade. I think um, it's, it's definitely a different set of values and priorities. Um, a, a short while ago, I came across a quote uh, on Twitter by Simon Sinek, and I'm just going to uh, read it out loud. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, 
and become more, you are a leader, right? Many of us actually think that unless, you know, you're the CEO of an organization that has 200 employees, has 100 millions of revenues, or, you know, that you lead a political party or, or a major organization, you're not a leader, but that is not the case, really. So very quickly on my um, career journey, I am a graduate of Brown University. I studied economics and international relations and um, started out my career as an investment banker in the US, in New York. Um, and then in the 10th year of my career, I had just delivered my second child. I was working for a private equity fund, which had invested in Galatasaray. And three weeks later, my boss called me into his office. I thought it was a catching up day, but it turned out that he was telling me that he was terminating my contract because I had two young children, only one and a half years apart. And he thought that I couldn't keep up with the pace of the fund anymore. I was extremely angry and hurt. I went out and hired a lawyer but the president of the club was actually my former client from Citibank. I had sold this company to Allied Signal a couple years back. And he said, Ebru, the easiest is to stay in your comfort zone and open that court case. But why don't you step out for a second and try, try this new opportunity? Come work with us as an interim CFO at the club. I thought about it and I said, why not? You know, let's give it a chance. So magic is sometimes outside of our little comfort zone. And of course, it was an extremely difficult career because football, as many of you know, especially in Turkey, is really a man's world. And I, during my time at the club, I worked with six different presidents, 10 different boards, and every time the president changed or the board changed, it was always the same question. Why do we have a female CEO? What would she know about football? Um, but what I knew about football, the revenues when I got there in 2000 were 20 million. When I left in 2015, it was more close to 200 million. So it seems like I did know something. I built the stadium. I merged our three different companies uh, in a very complicated reverse merger transaction. And um, we were very successful during the, the, the period. We won several local and national cups. And also I started um, uh, with an effort to be more present in the international world of football. In 2010, I was the first woman to be elected to the board of European Club Association. And um, it was a big honor. I got to work with the greatest names of football. Our, um, many of our uh, spectators will know them. Karl Heinz Rummenigge, um, CEOs of AC Milan, um, David Gill, CEO of Manchester United, presidents of Real Madrid Barcelona. So it was a wonderful period. I then became the general secretary of the Turkish Football Federation, which only lasted four months and five days. A horrible, horrible experience. It was my dream job, but it just didn't go well. I was out the door in four, four years, uh, four months and five days. And that's the point when after a wonderful 20 year career, you're like, oh my, God, what's wrong? What's wrong? What am I going to do now? And that's when you start evaluating, you know, what, what, what went wrong and what you could have done better, perhaps. And that was the moment when I started becoming more aware of um, how I only focused on my career and helping my organization, but never really looked outside to help other younger people or, you know, the, the women uh, in, in this field, which were not even a handful, basically. Um, so... It was a very difficult period because there was also a really uh, nasty social media defamation campaign against me. I received death threats and, uh, you know, for being the female general secretary of the Turkish FA and many different other things. And um, in the end, I decided, OK, Galatasaray is where my home is. I'm going to run for elections this time. I joined the board in 2013. And also during that period, I signed a contract with FIFA and UEFA as a consultant. 
And um, I was working with the development department. Um, and that's when I brought the idea to, to FIFA. And I said, I cannot be the only woman who is struggling with her career in football. There are thousands of people in the world that work in the 211 football countries. And why don't we start a leadership program for them? Um, and we devised a one week long program where half of it was um, uh, business skills, you know, marketing strategy, finance, um, uh, business development and uh, communications. And the other part of it was what the business world sometimes calls soft skills. But in my opinion, they are the real hard skills, which is about, you know, getting to know yourself and understanding your strengths and weaknesses, identifying your blind spots, how to be an authentic leader, how to lead with emotional intelligence. So all of those soft skills, which in my opinion really differentiates leaders. And with this program, we ended up going to more than 50 countries and worked with close to a thousand women over five years. And many of them, joined important um, you know, clubs or rose up in their own um, uh, organizations. And that's when I understood that it's really when you start sharing your knowledge and try to make a difference in the lives of the others, that's when you really become a leader, not when you lead a billion dollar company necessarily or you know, uh, uh, lead a group of people of thousands of employees. So that was a really turning point for me. And I left the club at, in 2015. And then I've been um, a board member, um, an investor, and also a, um, an advisor to several companies on um, their strategies. And uh, also I started chairing an organization called Women in Football, which is an NGO. We're all volunteers. We have a few part-time staff. But again, in England, we've been working very hard to transform the workplace for women working in industry. Um, so that's in a nutshell uh, my, my story. And I guess my recommendation to everybody, it's never too late to purpose and your passion. And once you, once you do find it, there's always time to mix them with your day job. There's always time to fulfill your passion. I do have a day job. I have many day jobs, but I also make time to, to make sure that I'm helping others in their own transformation and in their own leadership journeys. It's completely fascinating. And I'm um, sorry, I have two questions. I don't know if sure. we have... Um, a lot of time. Maybe we have Yavuz also who has questions. So I'm going to be fast. The first one was about the, uh, you were you were promoting women coming to your to your to your universe to, to the to the sports universe uh, soccer and then it, it it it has expanded. Do you think that the the the bias came from the woman and and the, the soccer team? Or from both sides, or more, uh, what, what were the, the, the, the bias coming from? Uh, I think she's disconnected, Lorraine. Okay. Uh, Ebru, she's a great leader. Uh, her quality of leadership is really fascinating and she's always inspiring us. Uh, she's our friend from Harvard Business School uh, and she, she did great presentation two years ago in Harvard Business School. Uh, her career all is inspiring ladies and men, especially men dominated world. I think uh, connections. Yes. Yeah, you, I think maybe, disconnected. Maybe we should we should um, move on to the to the next speaker. Yes. Yes. yes. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Boris, are you are you connected? Yes. Yes, he's connected, Lorraine. 
Just you need to open the uh, microphone, Boris. Yes, Boris. Boris. Boris. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Marie, Yahoo's Nestle. Great yeah, to see you folks. And it would have been fantastic to see a brew earlier on and uh, uh, a lot of other outstanding speakers and presenters. Great to be with you folks. Um, yes, we have the pleasure to have you, you today, Mr. Boris Simirinov. Who is I'm the sorry, I'm back. Oh, I don't know what's happening to my Wi-Fi. I really apologize. Yes, oh, uh, Boris, do, can you give us uh, two or three more minutes? Please? Absolutely, I would love to hear more. Hi, everyone. Hi, Boris. I'm you. I'm really sorry. <laughs> this is okay, this is the so... world we live in. S sometimes different t telecommunications providers play play play games on us. Yeah, I, I know. I know. More of your your amazing story again. Thank you. I, I'm just going to continue where I think I cut off, but I was saying it's a systemic issue. It is a problem of the ecosystem and it's both the lack of participation and push from the women in the industry because they lost their confidence in the system, you know, over the years, but it's also the um, lack of an understanding on the benefits of diversity on the top from the leaders, from the decision makers who are predominantly still white middle-aged men. But with this generational transition in leadership, things are shifting. And hopefully in the next decade or so, maybe as an NGO, women in football will not have to exist because the equality and inclusion and connection issues will not be a problem anymore. Thank you. So your recommendation will be for women to to keep chasing their their their passion and being them themselves. Exactly, because um, many of them, especially in our leadership courses, that's that's what we're seeing. Many of them expect to be noticed, respected, and um, given the opportunities and tapped on the shoulder to say, now it's your turn to lead. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen like that. You really have to put yourself forward. And um, we always set very high expectations for ourselves as women. And we are so afraid to fail because probably it was our parents or our society that put such high expectations on us over the years. But at the end of the day, so what if you don't get a job that you applied for or a promotion that you wished for? It will come the next time, hopefully, or go try your luck elsewhere if need be, but never give up, give up on your dreams. I think that is my most important advice and have the courage to try other things and get out of your comfort zone. One last question. Sure. Just following what you just said, don't give up on your dream. How didn't you give up on your dream? Aha, uh -huh. okay. It's so difficult what you've been through. Like yeah. the campaign, the, the, it, it must have been like. Well, so I mean, there are also some, there were also some family tragedies and personal difficulties along the way, which I didn't even mention. But yes. uh, look, in 1992, when I was in my second year at Morgan Stanley, I was applying for Harvard Business School. And my boyfriend at the time living in Turkey, he proposed. I was so happy. I said, yes, pulled back my application to Harvard and you know, move back, we are still married, that's the good news. So in 2017, 25 years later, I said to him, I never stopped thinking about Harvard one single day in my life. And I really, really want to go to this executive education program. And that is the connection between Boris, myself, Yavuz, and you and several others actually. So that was my big dream. And I did it after 25 years and I am so happy to have done it because it just put me in a, in a very different place, both in my mind, because I wasn't sure how I measured against all these wonderful global leaders. Um, having stayed in football for 20 years, I wasn't sure if my leadership skills were up to the same standards, but um, also building these international connections and revisiting my passion. So 
That was just wonderful. I waited 25 years. So if anyone of you in the audience have a dream that you left behind, go back, find it, and make sure that you realize it. Thank you so much. The story, the story is a really wow, wow story. Because men dominated world, uh, all over the world. Uh, it's a great example of how you can uh, destroy the places. I mean, the disruption. What we have done is a big disruption. Even for Turkey, even for, for, for the globe. Uh, with your family issues, uh, you attend a great quality of leadership. Uh, th thank you so much Ebru, for everything. Thank you for a great organization, Yavuz and Nestle, and a great moderation, Lorraine. I'm grateful for you. Boris? Boris? Yeah, I'm grateful for Ebru. Thank you. Bo Boris? I am, I am here. Lorraine, Yavuz, Nestle. Hi, it was great to be with you. İstanbul'dan getirdin de birkaç gömlek. Evde bir düz gömlek yok. Thank you. Uh, so we are, we are, we, I was for, for giving us a, a few minutes for to continue with, with um, uh, Ebru. It was so impactful. And so we have um, here with us, Mr. Boris Timerinov, who is the CEO of Semper 8 Group and also the leader of our <laughs> Boris is also a global speaker, a writer, and an educator. Boris, it's a great honor to have you here. Lorraine, thank you. It's fantastic to be here with you and a number of friends on the call and a number of other speakers whom it's a pleasure to meet. And of course, our, our wonderful audience, uh, which I've seen have been commenting on the event throughout the previous days. Great, great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Boris, what can you tell us about your company, Semper 8 Group? Uh, sure, Lorraine, uh, Semper 8, we're currently an interconnected group of Semper 8 Capital. We work with family offices, ultra high net worth individuals, and we do also merge and acquisitions and advisory assignments and restructurings. And then Semperate Health, where we are very much excited about the ability of healthcare and life sciences to bring extremely positive impact on people's lives. It uh, is an area that stimulates us intellectually. We think there's some great economic fundamentals in the space. So uh, we work with early stage businesses and we advise companies in healthcare and life sciences broadly in Semperate Health. And then separate media, we work on uh, innovative and thought-provoking content in the areas of film, TV, digital, and platforms. And that's that's separate. And can can you please tell us a bit about your journey to uh, Semper Eight with a global company? Oh, sure. Thank you for asking. Um, I was born and raised in Russia, and lived there up until the age of eighteen. I moved to Canada, had an opportunity to move to Canada after I finished the first year of university in Russia and was told that I would have a lot of issues doing that, uh, that my English would not be good enough and that I would not be able to transfer to a good school uh, because they wouldn't accept my transfer credits, wouldn't accept, accept my um, transfer documents. And so I was told I would need to go back five years because high school used to be four years in Canada, finished first year of university and, and then uh, redo, redo high school. So I had to uh, overcome a bunch of obstacles, finally was able to make it here in Canada and uh, finished uh, an undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto, got into mergers and acquisitions, investment banking, started working on deals and helping owners sell their businesses, sell their companies. Um, and then, uh, what happened there was I saw a, a, a big opportunity to learn uh, a variety of transactions, to learn a variety of types of deals and work with entrepreneurs in a wide plethora of sectors. Quickly became the person who was working on you know, four or five different projects when some folks in the space were working on one, one or two active transactions. And very much uh, learned deals 
from helping sell businesses to rolling up industries to doing complicated transactions. They were splitting up companies and carve outs. And uh, in the course of the work for about 12 and a half years, merchant acquisitions and investment banking became the special projects guy who was doing the most complicated things and which included uh, restructuring a venture capital fund, helping ultra high net worth individuals invest, and then also uh, doing, doing deals that were fundraisings for early stage businesses. And this was in healthcare, in food, industrials, telecommunications, entertainment, a, a wide variety of sectors. And then at some point uh, I had a, a view and I had a desire to be even more impactful to businesses to uh, follow on some of these special unusual projects, specifically the venture capital fund restructuring, the investments with ultra high net worth families and switch over to that side. So I started working with the family office of the chairman of the firm where I was previously, we were buying some small businesses. I was helping run one of the companies in the portfolio. And as I was about to leave the firm where I was previously, one of the partners said, Boris, you do the most complicated things we do. We need you on a new project. And I said, you know what? Leaving means I'm not doing new projects, but thank you. Thank you for asking. Thank you for suggesting. So uh, he then convinced me, convinced the chairman and the firm where I was, I was doing the investment and operations work for me to create Semperate. So Semperate at first was, was just me uh, working with the family office that I mentioned and also with the other project that the other partner suggested, uh, helping, helping do two, two or three at the same time, very complicated deals. And uh, I guess the, the thing that might be, might be interesting, that might be useful to people listening is, is certainly stumbling into opportunities, sometimes stumbling into entrepreneurship where I didn't think uh, I wanted to have my own entity, my own firm uh, at the outset, but that's, that's how it happened through the encouragement and help uh, of others. And similarly to how Ebru was mentioning the encouragement of her uh, former client who, who became uh, her uh, new, uh, new, new employer and, uh, and a collaborator. So similarly stumbled into having Semperate and then it developed later over time from just being me to having more and more folks with whom we're collaborating, with whom we're working directly, who are at Semperate, who are advisors officially or unofficially. And then now we, we're doing the kind of work that I mentioned that Semperate does in capital healthcare and on the media uh, side of the business. Um, and that's, that's my story in a nutshell. What is, uh, we will thank you very much for your contributions and support to our summit. Uh, I would like to ask how Harvard Business School or PLD program leadership development impact your life? What changed uh, after uh, the program in your life? Yeah, Vuz, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you and others who are organizing and contributing to the conference. Uh, Harvard Business School is, is the... Uh, is one of the pivotal experiences of my life so far, and one that several of us on the call share. It uh, was part of an overall journey in my life and, and a very significant milestone in a journey of self-development, self-improvement. Uh, it started, of course, from very thorough studies in Russia, then the uh, undergraduate degree here at the University of Toronto in Canada, then chartered financial analyst designation, uh, and then uh, the PLD program and alumni status at Harvard uh, Business School. The transformation that occurred throughout was that it brought more humility, it, and at the same time, more positive ambition and more desire to interact with the world, with amazing people, like a number of people here uh, on this call, and create things together that do good, that do good for the world, and do, do well by doing good. And, and certainly also reconfirmed my desire for continued learning and continued growth, continued self-improvement, such that after finishing the program, um, I, I also did a master's, a global professional master of laws at the University of Toronto Law School. And I, I hope to do some, something else, some other educational program or programs 
later down the road. It is very, very impressive, um, especially the way as a very young man, gentleman, you were able to see yourself in another country and there were so many barriers. What do you think are your driver for, drivers for success? And what may viewers find useful uh, uh, about them? Lorraine, th thanks for asking. And uh, you've pointed out having a bit of foresight, a bit of vision or, or drive. Yes, and so those, yeah, those, those, those, those, those certainly are some of the uh, areas of my personality that I consider to be some of the factors for success. Uh, I think vision is important. I think vision combined with execution is key, is paramount, where vision allows us to see far ahead and aim for important goals. And it is important since we're aiming far into the future that uh, sometimes, sometimes that future gets realized and we work hard to make it happen. That's extremely important is seeing it, but also working and making it visualized, making it manifested in, in the now. And I think what helps is if that vision is big, if it's broad, if it's global, because it is far, because you have to do a lot of work to get there. If you're working towards a big goal, I think one is more likely to succeed. And uh, the path there is not always straightforward. The path is not always a straight line. The path is hard sometimes. So persistence, uh, being, being strong-minded, uh, willful, and very organized towards the goal uh, I think I think is another component of, of vision meets execution. Uh, uh, the other thing that was shared earlier is uh, bringing people and bringing people together and keeping mm, keeping different kinds of resources also pointed at the goal. So I think there's a lot of amazing energy that comes from people who are inspired, from people who are focused together. Uh, as a team towards achieving the goal. And that is uh, partly through their support, uh, that is partly through their engagement, that is partly through the incentive. So I think one of the other big factors of success so far has been ab being able to work uh, very collaboratively with people and help people uh, see the goals that envision that I have or the other way around, support other people's and, and buy into other people's uh, vision and goals. And uh, the other piece is, uh, that was already mentioned uh, to a degree earlier in Yavuza's question is interconnected self-growth. I think if we're aiming towards self-improvement, if we're aiming towards new learnings, if we're aiming towards imparting new ideas onto ourselves, and then also helping others, helping others learn, helping others realize, helping others nurture their goals through, through mentoring, I think there's a virtuous cycle that benefits a person, feeds into that person's success by feeding into others' success and elevating others. Thank you so much. In this, this is a team that, that has came uh, forward um, during these last two days, and I would like to address it with you. In this time of crisis, um, Mr. Diamond, you know, the, the, the, the, the huge CEO of this market, mentioned that we are in a huge recession at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, and you, you still seek, uh, as you said, and find high potential companies and transactions at the moment. A lot of your work uh, centers around enabling successful ideas, business leaders to grow. And what do you consider to be a great opportunity even in this time of recession and, and crisis? Mm. Lorraine, uh, I think that opportunities are going to be different for different people, for different individuals and different companies. What I find is normally a good opportunity for us and for me. And I think personally that that's the case, some of the filters that I'll share through which I look at what's a good opportunity or not. I think it might be useful to others. And I think there are filters some others might use towards identifying their opportunities as well. Uh, 
in seeing a potential opportunity, first and foremost, I look at the people. I look at, are the people complementary? Complementary with that vision, with those goals that I shared with you earlier? And can they be people who can work together? Uh, secondly, I look at themes. Are these good themes? Are they themes that help others, that, help, that do good? And are they themes that align with the vision mentioned earlier? Further, can contributing to this opportunity, being part of this opportunity, can it add value to the opportunity? Can it become greater than what it was before through that participation? And then uh, these, are, these are three things. The fourth thing is, is time. And can enough time be committed to grow and nurture an opportunity? Mm -hmm. And lastly, impact. Uh, can there be enough impact? That means if it's an investment opportunity, investment in the business, uh, are there good people there or people one can align with properly? Uh, is it a good theme that makes sense and aligns with the vision? Can the investment, whether just through the capital or other kind of contribution, add value? Is there enough time to make a proper assessment of that investment and make proper contribution and impact? Is it going to have proper impact in terms of return of capital or in terms of impact on the society or in terms of personal impact where these five filters that I shared, uh, people, theme, value, and then the time and impact, they could be applied to looking at other kinds of opportunities too, where it might be uh, advisory work, or it might be being involved in a particular non-for-profit, but that's how I look at these things. And if I answer all five questions as yes, then that's a good opportunity for me. Thank you so much. It's it's very clear for for for people at the moment who are who are looking for um, new direction during the pandemic. And besides those five teams, what what would be your advice? Uh, for for them to start their company, their new venture, and keep going with it. Yes, I I think that if people are starting a venture, then I think it's uh, thinking through what is a an idea that they can get passionate about. Uh, what is the idea that they can pursue with that uh, persistence and fervor? Uh, and is it based on an underlying interest and an underlying history and experience of engagement with a particular topic, with a particular idea? Or perhaps the previous ideas, previous experience is something that people want to put slightly to the side and they want to look within themselves and say, what, it, what is it that I haven't explored yet that I believe I am extremely excited about that can add value to the world and that I can actually very thoughtfully, thoroughly contribute uh, to? And then if people are already in a particular business, particularly uh, in a particular venture, then I think it's always important assessing their progress and their ability to reach that goal that far out their vision and their ability to uh, help meet the vision with execution. And to the degree that they think that it is achievable and certainly using that persistence we talked about to push through boundaries, to push through obstacles and make things happen is important. Again, in a thoughtful way that doesn't forego execution, doesn't forego planning, doesn't forego actually actively thinking through obstacles, uh, thinking through the next next points, and and actually making making things happen. And then uh, what I've I've done recently is uh, I recently interviewed uh, folks who've written a book called uh, "Turning Crisis into Success." Uh, Richard Jaffe and Charlie Jaffe, uh, where they they're uh, father and daughter, and they come at it through two perspectives. Richard is a successful interpreter who've sold, who has sold a number of businesses. And uh, two of them were companies that went public and then were sold after they were public for an aggregate, I believe I have an excess of 900 million. And that was back in, call it 2000 or so dollars. And uh, Charlie is a psychologist. And so we, we did an interview and if folks are interested, uh, they can look that interview up through looking 
uh, look at me and get some more insights on how to pivot and how to pursue change and pursue pursue new opportunities. And those those are some of my my ideas, Lorraine. It is it is so precious because um, it seems that there is a lot of anxiety at the moment, and and to have this clear guidelines are are essential thank you so much boris it's a pleasure lorraine thank you and for all that you do for all uh, our harvard community it is you will never mention it but it is it must be pinpoint it's it, thank you so much you're welcome and thank you for mentioning it's a wonderful community and it's great to be part of it with amazing people like yourself like yavuz like Christy. We are proud of you, Gopuris. We are proud of you. You are contributing too much to Harvard community. You are in everywhere. Uh, we see you in many cities. You are sharing and you are trying to contribute to your old friends. Thank you so much for your support, uh, Boris. Thank you. Thank you. And we encourage our audience to connect with you uh, as soon as possible if they have great um, companies or ideas uh, that uh, need support. Fantastic, thank you. Semper 8. Um, Christy is our next uh, guest. Thank you so much to be here. Um, you are the author of so many bestsellers. Um, and the last one, I, if, you, if you let me uh, introduce it, Trauma Default, is, if I may say, uh, and in my humble opinion, a true masterpiece. For someone who is, for a beginner, you know, wanting to, to, to go on that journey of personal development, it's very, and for someone who has already read 100 books, you, you can find, it's a very small book, but you, at every stage of every stage, you can find like little piece of, of diamonds. It's just amazing. So I encourage ev everyone to read it from a default. And now, but today you wanted to really um, speak about the team that relates to our audience, self-reliance uh, and unlock your untapped, untaped potential in crisis as we all go through at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lorraine. I enjoy these speakers today. Yavuz, of course, Nestle. Um, actually, I, thank you, thank you. I, I changed it as we were talking. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't talk about self-reliance. Let's talk about why women aren't getting ahead. Um, but but I think they're, they're one and the same. And yeah. so one of the things that Ibru said was, she said that women lose confidence in the system. And one thing that I know for sure is, women lose confidence in the system when they're not confident in themselves and they're looking for external things to be able to hold their value. They're looking for external people or men or corporations to be able to tell them what their value is. But when you know what your value is and you're clear about it and you're honest with yourself about it and you own it, women are writing their own tickets. So even in the pandemic, I have 10 women who've been promoted since June, 2020, I have women who are 2X in their income and women who are getting 30 and 40% raises in less than two months. And it's not because we're doing anything magic. I'm actually making them aware of who they already are. And this goes to the self-reliance piece. So um, a, a short background about my journey. I spent 16 and a half years in the US Coast Guard chasing drug runners in the Caribbean. Um, regulating all the large oil companies. We were the federal or the, the federal authorities over maritime operations and mentored 90 people. I chose all the hard jobs. I had four degrees at the time. I was doing all the extra projects, doing all the extra work, had 160 people who worked for me. I was doing too much. And in 2012, I just couldn't stop proving people wrong <laughs> because to be a point one demographic in an organization is a male dominated organization. It was 50 black female officers out of 47,000 people. I thought that, and this is what I talk about at Trauma Default, Lorraine, that if I worked 
when I got in, the, got in there, they told me I didn't belong because I was black and I was a woman. And so I'm going to work to prove you wrong. And so then after the first two years, they said, you won't make it because you're black and you're a woman and I'm going to work to prove you wrong. And so 16 years later, they're still saying that you can't make it and I'm still working to prove them wrong. And so it shifted from you won't be anybody to now making it and them saying, who do you think you are? You think you're better than everybody. You're, you're walking around, you're, you're too confident in yourself. You think too highly of yourself. And I was like, well, I thought that you told me I would make it. So I was caught in a loop of proving people wrong. But a lot of challenges that women have is before we even entered the workplace, we were told when we were younger, you won't make it because you're a woman. You won't make it because you're a girl. Girls aren't supposed to do this. Girls aren't supposed to be smart and outspoken. Girls aren't supposed to be. So by the time we get to work, the loop is already, is just a culmination. And so I resigned with three and a half years left to retire with a full pension because I burned out and I was partially cray cray. And I never took care of myself. I never took care of my mental health. And, and I loved it when Mariette said, I embrace my emotions. Well, I didn't feel anything because I was highly criticized for my ambition. I was um, walking around with a thousand knobs in my back. So how can we embrace what we don't feel? And so I've learned over the past eight years that I was not the only one. I was not the only one that had these challenges. So after talking to 400 women in the US, I'm like high achieving women. So you have women and then you have high achieving women. We're completely different. We're five to 7% of the population. We want to go get it. And we're misunderstood and we're ostracized and we're mislabeled. Like I think about CETA and, and, and people think that we should be doing something different and we shouldn't want to do these things. And then when I ended up going to Harvard, I met women now internationally where we shared the exact same story you know women from south africa and taiwan and brazil and we had the exact same challenges and so a couple of things that i want to address right now is why do we have the challenges that we have and even in the crisis that we're in women were in a crisis long before 2020 rolled around and so one of the first challenges is women don't know their value. Women are walking around so beat up and abused and um, with a distorted image of themselves because they relied on the opinions of other people to validate who they are and they are missing out on their greatness. You know, Lorraine is just one of the absolute best beings in the entire universe. And she knows how great she is, but she doesn't really know how great she is. Do you know how great you are, Lorraine? Like, like women can't imagine how great they are because we want other people to think that we're great, but we don't think that we're great. And the gap is where we crumble because we're waiting for somebody else to value us and they were always gonna get it wrong because they're always going to expect that you should be somebody other than who you are. And so when women get clear on what their value is and really the trauma default is, who told you a long time ago that you wouldn't be anybody because this is the story that's playing in your head. So now you're 45 with the big house and the big car and you're married and kids and you're absolutely miserable and unfulfilled is because you're continuing to listen to that voice of somebody long gone from 40 years ago and repeating it in your present experience. So how can you live in your present life and be happy with all that you've attained? I talked to rock star women who are working themselves into an early grave because they never actually feel successful, regardless of how many awards they have, they're in Forbes and they're on the stages and they got Tiffany crystal trophies and they have all these things, have no idea because they're listening to somebody from long ago. So they're living in their present experience with a past voice. So that's one. Two, women don't have a clear vision of what's next because they're stuck proving somebody wrong. There's a quote that says, revenge is the best success. 
Well, not really, because revenge is you're working to prove somebody wrong. So you're still thinking about this person and what they said to you. And you're not looking at your future because you can't address your past and see your future at the exact same time. So any time that you're digging into the past to prove somebody wrong or to, you know, whether it was, a, a, you know, people, you know, all these single want, women want to get married, right? And then I talked to married women who are fighting the effects of what their husband said to them. So you have the life that you're supposed to have right now, which is what Ebru said. So you can't address the same thing at the same time. So if you choose, this is for the, the men and women, because I speak the language of their champions. Focus on your future only and let the past do what it's going to do and understand without the people that told you that you wouldn't be anybody, without the teacher that told you who you wouldn't be, without the opposition, because successful women, we are the watch me women. We are the, I will prove you wrong. I will work 80 hours. I will do whatever it takes to shove your head in the mud with my achievement. That's who we are. So understand that with, if they didn't tell you that you couldn't make it, you wouldn't have the fire to continue to propel, but now you have to forgive them and let it go and actually live in your passion and live from a point of passion and not from a point of pain. And then the last part is once you have a clear vision of who you are, uh, once women have a clear vision of what's next for them, you just got to ask. Ask for what you want and ask for it because you now know that you deserve it. Ask for it because you're standing on your you're living in your present achievements and you're living in your present greatness and not from a point of a, a distorted vision of yourself because you have no idea who you are. When you're clear on who you are, you will ask for what you want because you know that you deserve it. And then the very same people that you thought were holding you back will say, okay, They've been waiting. They've been waiting for you to ask. And, and Ibru talked about that. They are waiting, but we won't even allow ourselves to come in a room and then say that they're keeping us out of the rooms is you don't even knock on the door. So there is a, um, a, a scripture that says, ask and it is given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be given unto you. Uh, but we got to ask. Thank you so much. If, if I may um, add, uh, uh, ask a question um, mm -hmm. for members of our audience, because it's you, you use the same term as Boris uh, Tsimerinov, um, the term vision. Mm -hmm. What is the difference for people listening to you between um, a um, not a dream, but something like, oh, I, for example, I want to be a rock star, but I don't know how to sing, I don't know how, and I don't really want to be a rock star. It's just I've seen uh, Mick Jagger on, the, on, on YouTube, and I think he's extremely cool. But then with what you call both of you call vision, what is the mm -hmm. difference? How can you say, I go for this and not for that? You know, uh, Les Brown said, actually it was Les Brown or Joyce Meyer said, it was Joyce Meyer that said, I would rather wish for a lot and get a little of it than wish for a little and get all of it. So vision is something that's greater than you've ever seen. Vision is bringing resume selector to fruition because that was an idea <laughs> that you had, you know, three years ago and, and, and surviving the middle of it. So the difference between vision and a wish is how bad do you want it? And it's so big, but you are the only person that can attain it because the vision is given to you is clear on the greater part of who you're meant to be, but you're not the person who can attain it right now. And so what are you willing to do to be able to get out of your own way and not allow other people to talk you out of it because it's the dream that you have. And so I ask a lot of people, where do you want to be in five years? And they have, and they're unclear, but Lorraine, as I continue to dig and dig and, dig and I ask them the question in different ways, 
they've already seen who they are meant to be. But because it is so big, it scares them. They don't believe it. And so we all know, Dr. Miles Monroe said, we were all created to solve a problem for our generation. But many people get a job, but the job is not the work that you were called to do. And, and, and Yavuz were meant to bring resume selector to the world to be able to assist people in these times, in these challenging times. That is a vision. But will you survive the middle? Because I going to challenge you to make sure that you deserve to be at this place of um, success. So you would say that um, resume selector came to fruition because you were there. <laughs> no, you you yeah. saw you saw in your mind resume selector, right? So there there are sometimes when you you saw it, boom, it hit you in the head like an idea, and you believed it. So we all have ideas of being greater. We all have ideas that are coming to us, and one idea will will change your life. But will you believe it and will you grasp it? But would you say that it's the, the, the vision, as Boris also mentioned, is the highest, biggest version of, of yourself you or your, you are. of your accomplishment? Mm -hmm. that, that is the vision compared to, to a wish? It is the most scary thing? I, I, I'll say this. In... in 2014, uh, when I was down and out in my brother's house, broke and partially just burned out, I needed to have a vision of someone greater than where I was in that moment because it wasn't working for me. Does that make sense? So a lot of times our vision, we're, we're blocked by what we're thinking about in our past and what people say. And I asked the higher being, who do you want me to be? You can ask if you have no idea because sometimes the vision is greater than you are in that moment. Who do you want me to be? And he showed it to me the next day in meditation. And I said, that is outrageous. There's no way I'm going to be that person. So if you think about dropping a, a, a shot glass in a 55 gallon drum, I was not that person at that time. Now this was the greater vision of my highest and greatest self. But still, we're never really done, Lorraine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about Tony Shea, the, the, the creator of Zappos, or actually he ended up buying into Zappos. The CEO of da Zappos died yesterday. He had a greater vision to change downtown Las Vegas and ended up investing over $500 million. That was a vision. So we all get visions of being greater to impact other people, but will you believe it when you see it? So I was six years ago, I saw the vision. Now I'm closer to who that person of who I saw than I was six years ago, because I believed it and I was willing to do the work. And this is what I wish for our members of our of, of audience in, dif in these difficult times is if you have that inside of you, whatever it is, it's very, it is possible. What, what? Yeah, it's, it's the size of a mustard seed, your purpose. Like we're always talking about, we're looking for our purpose. It's there, it's within you. And, and what I talked about yesterday was it's, it's tattooed on your forehead. Everybody can see your greatness, the, the right people, not everybody, not your haters, but people can see who you are. But will you believe who you are and work to get to the next level? It's the size of a mustard seed. But the mustard seed, when planted in good ground, will spring up and sprout and be the largest tree of all where the birds will come and perch on its branches. So if you believe the dream that you have and you plant it in good ground, with this, which is within you, and you do the work and the personal development, I think that Mariette talked about, and you grow, and the birds are the people who right now, you know, the, the platform that you and, and Yavuz have created and Nestle, the people will come and perch on his branches and they will be blessed by your creation as well. 
It's amazing because it's uh, it is Boris as a young gentleman. It is Yavuz also who, who came back to happy group and mm -hmm. and had this exponential growth and now spreading the word. And it leads us to Mr. Armand Morin, our next uh, speaker, who began, like, as you said, mustard seed. It's a beautiful image. He began his journey with $1.83 dollar in his pocket. And now is uh, the owner and founder of multi-million international company. Hello, Mr. Ar Thank you, uh, Christy. Mr. Armand Morin, uh, thank you to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. What as to continue the the the beautiful conversation that we had with with uh, with Christy? What would you say about that? From from one point eighty three dollar, like less than two dollars, how would you? make it to fruition to uh, uh, limited from limited res resources to unlimited possibilities that you have right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the things that Christy just said was that you have to have a vision and obviously several people have had that. When I only had a dollar and 83 cents in my pocket and some people think that that's exaggerating, it's actually not. Um, let me just make sure, how about that? Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> when uh, one of the things that Christy uh, had mentioned was the idea of vision. And, um, you know, you have to have a vision. When I only had $1.83 uh, in my pocket, um, I had a vision. I had an idea. And it was actually a very big idea at that time. It was to compete with literally multi billion dollar companies. And um, I only had that. I could see it. I could see it in my head. Every night before I went to bed, I could envision exactly what that would look like. And I imagined what it would be when I was at the end of that. And honestly, when you looked at where I was, I was literally, uh, and this is no lie, in, in, in an apartment with absolutely no furniture except a desk. Uh, and I had a fax machine that I spent my last bit of money on. Uh, and that's what I used in order to start this company. Now, starting with $1.83 in my pocket, in two weeks after we launched the company, um, it went to $200,000, bam, in two weeks. Uh, in the first seven months, we did $1.7 million uh, and then ended up selling that company to a much larger company uh, at that time. And it was the idea that you didn't think about that you were trying to do something amazing, something incredible, but you had this vision of what you wanted to get and you just didn't know how to get there yet. And uh, one of the things Christy said is that you also have to go out and you have to ask. Well, one of the phrases that I use all the time is that you have to go out and get your no. Um, you know, people say, well, they're not going to say yes. They're not going to say yes. Well, then fine. Let's just prove it. Let's just go get your no. And then we can move on with our lives. Uh, so I think a lot of times in life, you just have to go out and you have to push and you have to see what a opportunities where Boris talked about opportunities that uh, exist, especially during these current times. Uh, and there are there. I think there is probably more opportunity right now in the world than there maybe ever has been in history. Uh, but it takes a little bit of change uh, in order to make that happen. And one of the things that um, while Christy was talking, bottom of the page, she didn't say speaker. She said virtual speaker. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant because uh, you know, I've trained a lot of spe people speaking, um, you know, Christy mentioned Les Brown, Les Brown's a very good friend of mine. And the fact is, is that you have to, you have to change, modify, and you have to adapt. Those are the three things that you have to do right now during these, these times. We have to change the way that we've been thinking. Offline maybe isn't the way to go in many places in the world right now. Um, we have to modify the tactics and the strategies that we're using in order to approach people differently. We can still have that high touch, 
that we've uh, had in the past where you can talk to people. We can do things just like we're doing right now. Um, many of you are halfway around the world and I'm not. So that makes it very easy though with technology today to actually come together and, and, and share a message literally worldwide, which really hasn't been possible before. And then you have to adapt to everything as it's changing because whatever the situation is right now, it's not going to remain the same. And through technology, uh, it's, it's going to be different. You know, one of the things that people ask me is always, how has my business changed um, since the beginning of COVID and things of that nature? And, and I was very fortunate. And the reason is, is because the vast majority of my business was already online. So it didn't really change, honestly, at all. It was just, I wasn't traveling the world speaking at different events. Instead, I was doing events just like this, speaking from home uh, and being able to do that uh, really anytime I wanted to, sometimes in the middle of the night, sometimes during the morning, sometimes during the day. So I, I think it's, again, just like many of the other people have said, it's, yes, it's having that vision right now. It's also being able to, again, change, modify, and adapt to what we are doing in order to meet the ever-changing demands of the world. But also, it is a matter of seeing those opportunities that exist currently in the world. And I think that there's so many opportunities. It's just a matter of being aware of what is happening around us. Does that make sense? Yes, that's my plan. Yes, it makes sense. <laughs> makes perfect sense and it seems also that this is very special in your in your journey um co correct me if i am wrong but i think it's, it's very insightful for our audience is you had this first uh success but then you were able to reinvent yourself right and to reach more success absolutely how, how do you explain that yeah, I mean, when, um, when I started that first company uh, way back when, that was in 1995. Yes. And uh, I sold, ended up selling that company. I didn't make a lot of money, okay, when I sold the company uh, because I had this uh, idea. The company offered us a bunch of stock within their company. And for whatever reason at the time, I took that option and uh, it didn't work out. <laughs> so I really didn't have any money at that particular point, but... I kept two things from my from the company that I had. I kept the biggest, baddest computer that we had at the time. Again, this was 1996 at this point. And then I kept my desk. That was the only two things that I had. And uh, so I was sitting there. And again, we just sold the company, so I had nothing to do. I'm literally in a studio apartment with no furniture except um, my desk and this computer. And I had a bed. That was it. And um, I read an article and Bill Gates said at the time, if your business is not on the internet, then your business is going to be out of business. And um, I thought, well, if he's the richest man in the world at the time, then he must know something that I don't. So I need to really, really think about what is uh, going to happen and where's, where's it gonna go next. And uh, again, there was no books, there was no courses, there, was, there wasn't any kind of information to teach you how to do anything on the internet, much less start a business of some sort. So I did what most people did back then. I, I got a disc in the mail from AOL and I put that into my machine and I got an account and uh, I was just surfing around the internet. And that first day I happened to see a competitor of mine from my previous company selling his products on the internet. And I thought, man, if he can sell these things on the internet, then maybe I could too. Well, to make a long story short, I figured out a simple way that first week on how to sell someone a product. And uh, we sold the product for $25. And that first week I made $8,000. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Um, but it was just the right timing at that time. And so I knew that technology was going to kind of put that little side hustle uh, out of business for me. So what I did was I started looking at different ways that I could do something. And what I came up with was something very simple. And this is something that anyone could do today. Um, I noticed that as I searched the internet, I, for those first few days, I honestly didn't even sleep. I went ahead 
and I just surfed everywhere. I don't know if any of you remember when you first got on the internet, but it was all this information that you could have access to. You could just search and find all the answers to everything in the world. It was right at your fingertips. And I spent, you know, again, days upon days, just searching, searching, searching. But when I found something I like, just like all of you do, I bookmarked it. And I found it maybe this new tool that did this and another tool that did this or another cool website that, that did this. And I saved all those bookmarks and I put them all together. And, and I sat down one day and I started thinking, you know, I, I have all these bookmarks and maybe uh, other people will find these bookmarks valuable as well. So I organized them and I put them into a, a very simple membership site. I password protected it. And then I started placing these little tiny classified ads on the internet and uh, offering people to access basically my bookmarks. And again, remember, I got these bookmarks for free. They didn't cost me a dime, uh, but I sold access to them for $110 a year. If people would pay me $110, you can access all these bookmarks. And they were about 600, 600 different things that you could get for free on the internet. Now, a lot of people ask, well, if you could get them for free, why did people pay for it? Well it's convenience. It's like when we had encyclopedias, why did people use or buy an encyclopedia set? It was because the convenience of having all the information in the same place. And that's why they paid for it. And so as I did the work for them, they paid to get access to it. And it was that simple. But here's what happened next, which was really kind of unbelievable. And that was those bookmarks, I started posting classified ads. And the first day I had 10 sales. And I was so excited, so happy because 10 times $110, that was $1,100 for the day. And I'm like, man, this is, this is so easy. This is so simple. And uh, I just put some ads out there and people bought this. And then the next day I, I, I had a few more sales. Actually, I had about a hundred sales the next day. Um, so I, I just made like a little over you know, $11,000 and I was extremely happy. But then in the next week, I had a thousand sales. So I just made a hundred thousand dollars in just seven days by selling these bookmarks. And then it kind of went crazy. Uh, all of a sudden my servers started crashing and people started buying and more and more and more. And over the course of the next 12 weeks, um, I sold a uh, 12,000 people, uh, I'm sorry, 35,000 people uh, access to my bookmarks. We brought in a total of $4.2 million dollars in 12 weeks, something that the internet in the world hasn't even seen at that point. So, but that sounds really good and it sounds really nice, but also remember the one thing I just said a moment ago was that the internet in the world has never seen it before. So my merchant account got really, really nervous and they, they took away my merchant account. They took away my ability to process credit cards. And not only that, but they went into my bank account and took half my money as well too. Now you have to think about what just happened. I just did something that the world had never seen before. I was on track if everything consistently went the way uh, it was going at that point to do $155 million in sales that year. Uh, again, from nothing, selling bookmarks, mind you. Um, and the, the bank went in and took half my money, uh, the, the credit card company. The other half I paid out in what's called affiliates. In other words, they helped me promote and I paid them half. So again, I just did something that has never been done. And uh, I now have essentially almost no money left over. But that was the best thing. It wasn't at the time, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because that was what I would call the second phase of what I did. But the third phase was the most important. And that is, I was stuck at this particular point, knowing full well that I could sell something on the internet, I could sell products, I could sell services on the internet. And uh, the problem was, is that when someone takes away your ability to process credit cards, the companies put you on a blacklist, which means that no one will allow you to accept credit cards. You can't get another one very easily. So what happened was I started researching, how can I process credit cards without having this merchant account that I needed? And I discovered that there's a lot of different ways to do that. And so I wrote a little tiny book, a little tiny ebook at the time. Um, and that ebook basically showed other people the ways that I found 
to process credit cards without having to have a merchant account. And I sold it just for $19, $19 and 97 cents. And I'll never forget that because I was in an apartment and I got my first sale. It took me like four months to put this together. Today, it would take me probably two days. But at the time, it was four months to put this together. And um, my, my wife, she, she didn't understand it because we weren't married at that time, but she didn't understand why when I got that first sale, I was so excited about it. And, and she's like, what, what do you, why are you so excited? Because, you know, I had already made you know, literally millions of dollars, but uh, again, I didn't have anything. But the fact is, is that she's like, why are you so excited? I said, you don't understand. I wrote a book. And I sold it online for $20 and, and someone bought it and they didn't know me. And I, and she's like, yeah. And I'm said, well, if I can sell one, I can sell thousands. I said, so that's what's, what's exciting about it. So, um, but in this process was the key, the secret, if you will, um, in this process of writing that book that took me four months to do, I discovered that there was a, a, a process that I, I just never knew existed. Because when I was creating this book, I needed, at the time I needed to create, uh, I needed software to create this ebook. It, it wasn't like a PDF is today, where we think of an ebook as a, a PDF file. Well, back then it was something much more simple. It was uh, this, actually much more complicated. It was a software that you had to buy. And I didn't know which one to buy. So I bought number one, I bought number two, I, I bought number three, number four, number five. And I bought about seven different kinds of software. Um, that made these eBooks. And I didn't like really any of them. I liked some of it, but I didn't like all of it. And then I said those words that a lot of people probably say today at some point in their life. And that is, if someone could take all the good things and, and then get rid of all the bad things, I, I bet you they would make a million dollars. That was my thought. So if I made my own eBook software, I, I could do this. But again, I had a problem. The problem was I didn't know how to write software, right? So that's kind of an issue. So what I did was I started looking around for someone that had this already. And I found this company in Czechoslovakia that I, I gave them my last money. I had $5,000 and I, I just went all in. Boom. Here it is. Um, if you can make me the software, um, you know, I think it will work. So I invested everything that I had to make this piece of software. And um, I got the software back and I started sharing it with other people and telling other people about it. Well, I didn't make a million dollars overnight, but over the course of the next 10 years uh, in that, so- that one software, I made a million dollars from that one software without question uh, and even more. But that software, as I started marketing it, people started asking me questions about my website. They said, and I called the software ebook generator. That was the name of it at the time. And so what I did was I went out there And uh, I started sharing it with other people and we started making sales and it was great. Uh, And then people started asking me, how'd you make those header graphics on your website? And I said, well, you know, it's very simple. This, I did this. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if someone could make a piece of software that did these header graphics? And so I did that and I made this software and I outsourced it again. I didn't know anything about programming. Then uh, people said, how do you make these these graphics to make these digital books that that look like e-cover graphics. Well, we made a piece of software that did that. And then we had this other piece of software that a lot of people will probably hate me for. Uh, And people said, well, how did you put those pop-ups on your website? And so I made the software that created pop-ups, which turned out to be the most influential software that ever made pop-ups in the history of the internet. Um, So you can thank me for all those pop-ups that you get on those websites that you go to, uh, because chances are that my software actually probably did that uh, throughout your life. And so that was kind of interesting. So in total, we made about 30 different pieces of software, but along the way, I, uh, and again, I didn't program a bit of it myself. I didn't know how to. So that was the other key is that just because you don't know how to do something doesn't mean it should really stop you. But along the way, I, I, you know, people start asking me a different question that changed again, this next phase. And that is, how did you market all of this? How did you advertise it? How did you write your sales letter? How did you do all this? And so I start teaching people about what I did to market my own products in my own business. And as a result of that, now I have literally the longest running internet marketing coaching company in the world. Uh, we've been doing this now for 18 years, uh, just teaching people how to build their businesses, what to do in their businesses, 
And, and the difference is, is that I use myself as a guinea pig. And in other words, what I do is I go and I make the mistakes first. And then I simply share with people um, what not to do. And then more importantly, what to do. And, and that honestly is probably one of the most simple things that anyone listening right now could ever do is share with people your life experiences uh, and show them what you did and show them how you did it and show them what to avoid and show them things that they can do to stop the mistakes that they're making uh, or are about to make, which is even probably more important than that. So by doing that, um, it's just worked out incredibly well. Uh, and that's what I continue to do today. I still, I, honestly, I still make software today because I actually like it. I, over the years, I actually taught myself how to program because, well, I like it. Um, and the other part to that is that um, I still simply advertise, I, I market my business, I market my products, and then I simply share with people exactly what I did. And I think that is probably the most simplistic thing, like I said, that anyone could possibly do. Thank you very much for your, for your uh, generosity. Um, Mr. Uh, Onu Yuxa, we could listen to, to, your, to your adventurous journey um, a lot more, but we have Mr. Onu, Onu Yuxel who is going to talk after you. And he has also um, many wisdom to transfer to our audience because he was the, the one of the director of Nielsen who is studying the market. So is going to be, uh, he's going to continue on your direction of products and understanding the consumer. Maybe one last question because I think you ep epitomize, like many, many other, other leaders, um, you epitomize today success. And during those three days, I didn't dare to ask this question, but because it's our last day, what would you say to someone who has success, who experienced success, to stay grounded as you did and as other leaders that we've seen during these three days remain with integrity, remain with uh, good um, health. How do you do that when you experience great success? In a few sentences, because we have uh, sure. lockdown in Turkey too. Thank you so yeah, much. I, absolutely. Um, I think that the, to stay grounded, you have to remember where you came from. That um, you know, I grew up in a family that didn't have a lot of money. That was always looking for money and just didn't have it. And, um, you know, I always remember my beginnings as opposed to where I am now. The, by remembering the beginnings, you can sympathize and you can empathize with the people that are, that are asking you the questions that you might want to disregard uh, and help those people a bit more because now you have a, a more clear understanding that you were in that same spot before. So my advice to stay grounded is remember that as well as you've done, it can all go away in an instant. But the fact is, is that you want to help the people get to where they want to get to. And if you help enough of those people, then you'll automatically get what you want. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And um, Armand Florin, thank you so much for your great contributions and support. You are one of the uh, biggest marketer in the world. Uh, we, <laughs> thank thanks, you. thanks you so much. We have last time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Mr. Yuxen, uh, I don't know if yes, you're- sir. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We had so such wonderful speakers, uh, so we, we wanted to-, to Exactly. I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, with, yes. with everyone uh, what they, they are explaining, they are, they are sharing from their uh, life and experiences. And uh, people who has you know, great vision are really extraordinary people. And uh, I really see this is very important and this is a gift from God maybe to, to some people they, who, who has extra extraordinary vision because they can achieve extraordinary results. So, but what I'm going to defend is more about simplicity, basics to achieve our targets, to achieve our uh, vision, let's say. And uh, maybe it, it would be good to share my screen. I prepared a couple of simple slides. If you uh, let me, uh, because I think it's disabled from the host. Just let me know when it is 
Oh, no, he's go. my closer friend. Uh, I know him such a long time. Uh, he was head of 16 countries in Zetnisen, and now he moved to the Saudi Arabia. He will tell more about his story. Yes. He has also uh, thank you very a much. Yeah. expansion growth strategy story in terms of uh, professional career. Thank, thank you. Thank you really much. I'm really appreciating uh, your yeah. nice words, uh, Yos. And uh, still, I think I'm not able to share my screen. It says, uh, I'm receiving a message, host disabled the screen sharing. Can you release, please? Yes. Uh, do you try to share your uh, presentation, Mr. Yes, Ono? Please. Yes, please. Yeah, but we don't have enough time. That's why uh, please share your thoughts and your experiences in person because uh, because of this lockdown situation, our old plans changed. We couldn't uh, ex accept any presentation due to our limit time limitation yeah that's fine that's fine as i mentioned in the beginning in this case let me let, let me share my thoughts and maybe yeah. i can grab up some ideas from my uh, presentation as well and uh, share share with you guys so uh, actually i i have a quote to actual, actualize big dreams don't wait for tomorrow start yesterday yes so it means, I mean, to make your dreams come true, just don't wait. I mean, take a decision and start. Uh, but what we find, if you compare with the previous period, if you're producing more with the same amount of capital and the same amount of labor force, this is because of efficiency. So. In mathematics, uh, we call this total factor productivity, actually. And uh, to, to achieve the growth, I see three basic uh, parameters. One of them is about artificial financial boosting. The other one is inorganic growth. And the last one is organic growth. And uh, I can give you several examples from different industries, but maybe it's, it's good to Give some examples from how governments are taking this. And one example, maybe from experience from the retailer side. And uh, for example, in economy example, countries may inject money to the economy by printing money and give loans to companies to support. We see an artificial growth for some time, but later on, this may cause devaluation. This is how happening in many countries. And then in my experience in retailer side, retailers and uh, manufacturers are pushing the sales with price cuts, promotions, boosting the sales. However, this is not uh, profitable. And uh, this is not a good growth, good healthy growth. And after a while, uh, we see all retailers are competing with each other and some of them going to bankruptcy because of this is not sustainable. When we think about inorganic growth, some governments, some economies may advise minimum three kids, four kids for each family. And what happens? Populations increase and by person, people become poorer. But in the deep total, economy grows and we see an unrealistic growth. In retail example, retailers are opening many stores without investing to efficiency. And they see a huge change in the deep total, but maybe they are losing in store level. But when we think about organic growth, which I defend, for example, in economy example, governments are investing in education, science, technology, law, and strong money, money regulations. And in time, we see a stronger healthy growth. In retail example, if retailers invest for efficiency, they grow healthy in store level. 
only after this is a healthy investment for uh, more stocks. And for formula of growth, three basic things are important in my opinion. Research and learn, simplicity, speed and taking action. The rest are all materials and tools like uh, investing in cloud, technology, loyalty programs, branding, marketing. These are all helping to the basics. And research and learning is very important. And again, it is covering three basic parameters. Understanding your customer and expectations of your customer, having the right product and learning about the competition. It's not always you have a unique product. So maybe some others have the same, similar thing. So you need to understand the approach for, from your co uh, competition as well. And learning from your customer is important. Understanding your customer, who is your customer? What is his profile? What is his needs? What is his expectations? Is he a big family man or a single man? Identifying uh, his shopping needs is very crucial. And maybe he has basic two, three needs, but the expectations should be huge. A clean and tidy store, convenience to get to, value for money, quality, healthy products, promotions, easy parking, all these needs in once or all together. And of course, having the right product is also very important. Having the right assortment, having the right quality and having the right price. Selling this ebook from 1999 is a good price or uh, having the price from 999, which is, which, is, which is good. You need to find out uh, from the researchers and understanding. Yes. So the slogan is nothing more and nothing less. Exactly, you have to approach what is needed. This is, this is, this is the point. Uh, I would like to go directly uh, to the maybe end because of time uh, limitation. Perfect will never exist. So dream big and decide the strategy. Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, stays in his six rules, number three, don't be afraid to fail and plan the business case, set goals, build the roadmap and don't be shy. Don't scare to act, just start. Take action and start yesterday. This is all I would like to share with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your great contributions, Omr. Thank you. Us. Have a great day. Bye. Uh, thank yes. you so much. Yes, Lori. It's a pleasure for us to be with you, Mr. Murat Onur Yuksa. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Right, Lauren. Yes, please. Do we have time for for a question? Uh, please ask your question to dear Christy. Then we will close the session with our last words. We will finish this summit. Um, I think the the president of. Um, Nvidia said something. That Nvidia said something very interesting, and it resonated with what you just said. And he, he was, he was also, he was, um, he was pushing people to analyze also, as you as you said before, and adding one more uh, um, one more thing was that great, extraordinary, spectacular success is mindful of analyzing as who you have seen in your career, what explain a great success a pro for a product? All right. Uh, actually, this is all about expectations of our uh, tar target customers. And uh, Firstly, we need to listen to them. We need to learn how to listen. If we have one great idea, maybe this idea works for us, but doesn't work for our uh, consumer, right? Or for, for our the customers. That's why uh, maybe we need to adapt our idea to the expectations. Our idea may work 
extraordinarily good in part of in some part of the world, but may not work maybe in another part of the world. And uh, so that's why uh, maybe it would be good to understand uh, the the the area, the target area, and the expectations. Only after this we can we can achieve the success. I think. And we, we should not we should get rid of the complex. Uh, we should get rid of uh, many parameters uh, causing uh, causing us to take decision decision late. So we need to take decision very fast. This is for sure. But at the same time, we will we, we will be very solution oriented. We have to solve an expectation and a need of our uh, customers. Uh, like Arman mentioned, he. He experienced first himself, and he brought a simple solution to simplify people's life. Everything comes from simplicity. If we work on simplicity and basics, we will not spend time. We will uh, also uh, help people uh, in a better way, I believe. Honor, you worked for 16 different countries, and you observed many different cultures. And we know cultures uh, eat strategy during breakfast. Uh, how you handled all of these cultures with your experience? Just two, two, two sentences. Uh, actually, by adapting myself to each different country. Now I am in Saudi, and the first first thing I, I did because I have my own hobbies, I went out. I found a place for uh, cycling. I found a place uh, where I can. I can uh, where, where, where I can find my food. They say I like sushi. I like uh, some uh, some different foods. So I, while I'm doing these things, I, I was on a video call with my wife, and she said, "Look at this. She, he's still he's again adapting himself to his you know environment." <laughs> uh, so this this is an anecdote. This is sort thing. So adapting yourself to the environment is very crucial. If you try to adapt all people to yourself, it's not possible. Congratulations for all your success. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you very much. Mr. Yavuz, would you like to end this summit? Uh, the last word, uh, you will give them just one, one sentence, Lorraine, then we can close. At the end, I can close. What, one more sentence from just one, one small sentence be from Christy and from others who is yeah. who, been on the screen. I suggest Neslian because you are the heart of this project. So please do us the honor to to give first your sentence. You can move, you can start from Christy. I think uh, voice doesn't go into. Okay. Christy, do you, sorry, do, would you like to, to give a sentence to conclude the summit? Sure. Uh, I, I would love to say, based on all the speakers today, they gave so much. Um, so it's, it's a three part sentence. One is never too late. One, turn impossible to possible. And three, never, ever, ever quit. No matter how many times you fall down, there's always another opportunity, as Ama just talked about. There's always another opportunity and another door that is available for you. So just keep going and, uh, and know that greater is waiting for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think she couldn't be able to hear. Uh, Lorraine, we can close. Two, three important dimension last three days uh, we focused on. First, how setting goals can change and transform your life. Almost all speakers mentioned. I gave Alice in Wonderland example. And second one, how to respond to change instead of growth because everything is changing around us and we change around the, of everything. And the last one, Transformation from I statement to we statement. We, we, we born alone, we live alone, but we are not alone in this world. Just when we understand we are not alone, we are family, all we are together, 
the world will be totally different place. Thank you very much for all great volunteer speakers. They were ready to help and support uh, what their hand in what they have in their hand, also in their heart. Uh, we are proud of them. Thank you so much, Lorraine, for Nestian as well uh, for your great moderation. Thank you, and Mr. Yabu Selim Silei for for his amazing questions that really Thank push speakers forward. Thank you very much for your contribution also. Thank you. This was an amazing teamwork under Yavuz Altun's leadership. I am really humbled and honored to meet all these amazing leaders and really the shared experiences, the heart-centric leadership, setting goals, you know, focusing on great souls and empathizing with people and bringing the best out of the leaders. I'm really impressed and honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. If, if I may say a last word, um, yes, um, resonating with Mr. Yuxel, I think while listening yeah. to all the speakers during these three days, it's really that simple. There is a simplicity in high achiever speakers, high achievers leaders. They saw something, they had the idea, and they work, and they work, they get, they know. It's really simple how much you can take and move forward with integrity, love, and courage. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next time, uh, your, your microphone is working. You can say your last word because we were waiting you. Can you hear us? No. Uh, yes. Do you ask Christy, Mr. Yavuz? Yes. Uh, we couldn't be able to hear you. Your last word, we are closing with your last word. Uh, it seems uh, I will close the session. Uh, dear great souls, it was wonderful three days. We filled all the days with many great leaders, their vision, and uh, we can earn millions of money. We can work uh, as leaders. We can teach many things. But let's be human. Let's serve. Let's share because sharing is caring. I appreciate all your support, all your uh, encouragement. And also we have wonderful team here. They supported us during the days and nights. I am uh, grateful. Mr. Yavuz also, Lorraine, and all of you. Thank you, and next, nice to meet you. Let's meet in the next meetings, next events. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Yavuz. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Honor. Have a great night in Saudi. To Christy, to United States as well. Hello. Today, I will be telling the long-term success story of Happy Center, 100% Turkish company. Our happiness journey starts from this beautiful city where Asia and Europe meets, Istanbul. Started the business in a tiny store in Tatekale in 1986, our firm's reputation has now been the limits of our country. In our companion's factories, equipped with world-class machines, we produce everything that facilitates everyday life. From food to cleaning, from cosmetics to paper products. At this very moment, we're transporting our natural products, neatly grown in thousands of square meters of agricultural land, preserving their freshness. more than 4,000 employees in over 130 branches with over 250 suppliers offering the best brands in the world we welcome more than 3 million happy customers every month <laughs>